She's known to many of us as a prominent staple of the New York City drag scene and RuPaul's dearest friend. But her career, LGBT work, and political advocacy span much more than that. She is a star booty of a legend. Her wig stock is out of this world. And she has a brand new comedy special, Contagious, which is available today. Her name is Lady Bunny, and she's about to be exposed virtually. Well, thank you so much for being here, Bunny. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. I'm not completely exposed because, you know, as I hear RuPaul does when she's filming Drag Race, when she walks down the runway, she's wearing the girdle and the heels and the tuck. Then when she goes and sits back behind, behind the desk, she takes the heels, the girdle, and the tuck off, and you just see her from here up. So I'm, I, that, that is one of Mama Roo's most genius creations that I'm enjoying today. Now, one thing that I really liked about when I was delving into your life is that you and I have a very similar trajectory. I was born and raised in Tennessee. I moved to Atlanta. Then I moved to New York. And now I'm in LA, I mean, you're still in New York. So I was like, this is gonna be very interesting just hearing your stories. Yes, well, when I was living in Atlanta, there were still horse and buggies. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, outside Pity Pat's porch. So I don't know if, uh, if we know the same Atlanta, but hey, we might. We might, we might. So you were born and raised in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, born in Wilmington, North Carolina, but grew okay. up in Chattanooga. How, how was Little Bunny? You know, Little Bunny was not much different from Big Bunny. I was always very outgoing. I was the class clown. At one point, the teacher uh, in maybe fourth grade uh in order to stop me uh, giggling and, and cutting up, she made me sit at her desk um, facing the class, which was such a big mistake because whenever she was turned away at the back blackboard, I was like, you know, you know, imitating her speech, you know, going or, or, or or just any stupid thing that I can imagine. So, so yes, I was always the class clown. And so you're growing up and then I heard that you were 13 years old, you sneak into a club in Chattanooga. How in the world did you get into a club at 13 years old? Well, I was cute and there's always older men <laughs> who like young boys and, uh, at one point, I don't know if anyone remembers those uh, rayon disco shirts, but um, I had gotten my mom to buy one and wore it out to the club with this older, you know, guy and got very drunk, vomited on the shirt. He went home with him and he washed it and rayon shrinks. And so I got home with my new you know, shirt not fitting, and my mother knew something was up. So <laughs> I had a way of getting into, uh, you know, clubs. I actually um, did not meet, but I saw Lady Chablis from Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, who was performing at Chattanooga's Go Go Club. My uh, drag mother, who doesn't claim me as her drag daughter, um, you know, but but who you know, was the leading light of Chattanooga drag. Chattanooga's own 20th Century Fox, Tasha Khan, AKA Chattanooga's own bubbling brown sugar. And uh, so, you know, that, that you know, listen, in Chattanooga, there's not a lot of women that wear false eyelashes and big wigs and sequins. So I was, you know, drawn to the glamor and I love my mother dearly, but you know, she's not really a, a glamor puss and so I, I i i fell in love with uh you know the 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 drag scene there and funnily enough the first trans woman who i ever laid eyes on just passed uh i kept up with her she uh you know moved from chattanooga to atlanta and so i must have been 14 
my my parents were uh, and I were driving past the Chattanooga Choo Choo, and there was kind of a seedy part of town, uh, and there was outside a club uh, called the Cross Keys, uh, a trans woman, and the disc the the style of dress was like a Kiana, like a silky polyester dress, and she had taken a a silver cord and wrapped it around her waist and then around her boobs because she just started taking hormones and had small boobs and that maximized her boobs. So, uh, you know, Regina Sims was, you know, sometimes, you, you, you know, I mean, she wasn't like a leading, you know, light, you know, in, in the performing world or whatever, but she was very well loved. And it's just interesting how you can sometimes just driving from the Chattanooga Choo Choo, before you even knew what you were, see one of your people and just by the fact that she was being her, it really led me on the trajectory um, that I'm still on. Well, especially because, you know, Tennessee is not that progressive and back then I'm pretty sure it wasn't either. So seeing that must have been something very incredible. It, it, it totally, totally, totally incredible. But for, for to be a, a small, you know, second or possibly third tier in the South, honey, drag in the South is no joke. And you didn't get up there if you didn't have something like a lot of the queens that we see today. I mean, you 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 weren't booked if you couldn't, uh, you know, tear the house down. <laughs> it was very common back then to do a number, and if it went over really well, they would start the song up again and do the last third so they could the performer could come back out and they would be lavished with tips, like making making thousands sometimes. That's so, crazy. Yeah, so these these were these were our stars. And you know, in the South, drag is 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 worshipped and you you end up seeing all of this and you're exposed to this and then when did you end up first donning a wig and performing and what led behind your name i heard that you were not originally lady bunny i was always lady bunny but you know i think john cougar mellencamp had changed his name to something and i just thought that was so ridiculous so at one point i was calling myself Lady Bunny Hickory Dickory Doc Cougar <laughs> Melon Camp, and you know, I mean, I mean, let's just let's let's just say this: LSD was taken in those days, so so that might explain the name. And then it be, then it became then it became the quote Lady unquote Bunny, but then when you know my career, you know gained some notoriety the press kept mixing it up and they would put the quotes around the so it was like <laughs> quote the unquote lady was as if there were others so i just said honey just make it lady bunny but rue still <laughs> likes to call me the lady bunny what was your first performance like my first performance was in first grade and i was a big fan of barbara Eden in I Dream of Jeannie and our, our you know my elementary school had a um, circus theme and so my mom made me kind of like that red short you know like Jeannie vest with like the puffy sleeves not drag but like a turban and you better believe I had that slanted eye makeup basically the same makeup I wear today but <laughs> without, without the lashes and so I was playing a snake charmer and I've charmed a few snakes since then. And, you know, so I was like doodling on some pathetic recorder where, where went in front of a basket and there was a snake with an invisible string that would come up because of it. And let's just say I've charmed quite a few snakes since then. It started so, young. <laughs> I did, I did. But so that was my, that was my first, uh, you know, uh, you know, drag performance. And I would get in drag for, you know, Halloween. I mean, no one really thought anything of it. I think I was like 11 and I just went as a woman and my best friend was my husband. <laughs> no, one said, <laughs> no one said anything. They were like, oh, there's that angle, kid. <laughs> so you end up making the move from Tennessee to Atlanta 
Did you meet RuPaul directly in Atlanta? We were both go-go dancing for a band called The Now Explosion. And um, we, we, you know, we didn't really work in gay bars. We worked in rock clubs that were very mixed. So uh, the B-52s were from Athens. There was another band called uh, Pylon, which was a new wave, a popular band. I'm pretty sure 10,000 maniacs were from Atlanta. So there was a there was a live music scene and uh Larry T who wrote Supermodel uh had a band called The Now Explosion and Rue and I were their backup dancers and we didn't really have an act. We just wanted to make the scene. Were you yeah. dressed up back then? Did you have a wig and like everything oh. on? Oh yes, but I mean we were broke. So we were very much looked down on as like the 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 booger club kids. I mean, Rue Rue would wear like a, a hot pants and and like fisherman's thigh high wading boots, uh, uh, big football shoulder pads and a mohawk. I mean, basically we were go-go dancers and clubs hired us to just provide some, uh, you know, entertainment. But the, the, the serious drag queens in their bugle bead, you know, butterfly tops who lip synced to Melissa Manchester and Tina Turner, uh, the, 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 they, they definitely treated us like the poor, you know, cousins. What, what was the Atlanta scene like back then? Well, I mean, I was 20, 21, and um, everybody wanted it. <laughs> and, and most of them got it. So it was, I mean, to, to come from, you know, like a smaller city, you know, like Chattanooga, to go to Atlanta, I mean, you know, all the gays lived in Midtown before they, listen, move wherever you want, but they moved out to... Uh, uh, to be out by the malls. So they, they, they killed their own, you know, paradise because everyone lived near the bars. So you never had to, to drive drunk. There were, you know, nice old houses that, that many of them refurbished. So, you know, I guess America's consumer, I mean, it, it was, it, 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 there was a hotel that Doris Day did the interior of called the Cabana. And, um, and, and so it, after I left Atlanta, that Midtown area got crackier and crackier. And um, so, uh, but, but it, 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 it was magnificent because it was, I mean, I, I'm never, I've never, I mean, New York, you know, New York had that too, you know, it has a street scene, but so in so many uh, cities in this country, there's no street scene and, you know, friends with everyone, you know, walking, you know, past each other. And the, the thing that really, you know, makes me, you know, scratch my hair is, is when people say that Rue is transphobic because he wasn't back then. And, you know, we, we, we had apartments, but we were evicted, you know, you know, reasonably often. And, and, you know, I, I worked at Popeye's and, uh, you know, um, so we, we were, you know, hardly living high on the hog. We loved the trans hookers. We knew them by name. We, you know, we repeated what they said, you know, we, we hung out with them. So if Rue is transphobic, th th that's a recent development. And, 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 you know, in, in the same way that when we moved to New York, we lived in the meat market when it was, where the trans hookers plied their trade. And um, again, we knew them and we spoke to them and we had, we thought that they were, we thought that they were extremely entertaining. So, you know, if you're, if, it, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, trans activists who, you know, blast through for not having trans uh, people on a show called Drag Race. It's not called trans race. And, you know, Rue coming from the club scene knows good and well that trans people have always performed alongside drag. Listen, if you work in clubs as a drag queen or drag king, if you have a problem with trans people, 
you ain't working much because they are part of the, the, the fabric, you know? So I've always seen them as sisters and I've never understood the animosity um, that has, you know, sprung up. I mean, Rue did say a few silly things that it sounded like someone, you know, when he said, this is the uh, Olympics of drag and, and we don't take, uh, you know, uh, uh, enhancing, you know, drugs or whatever, which I guess meant hormones. To me, that sounds like something that someone wrote for Rue to say, to, to, to sound sassy. But I, as an old friend of Rue, I cannot imagine that Rue is in any way a transphobe. Do you think that it's just like a generational thing where like younger generation of LGBT community view, views drag in a different concept? I think it's a generational thing where younger people are obsessed with pronouns and they, they are, they are, they like to put each other, you know, in, in, ter in very rigid boxes of I am non-binary or I am, you know, uh, you know, this or that when the community was coming up, you know, d developing in the 60s and 70s. We were just glad to have a community. We weren't, we weren't trying to, you know, necessarily bash, you know, other members of the community. I'm, listen, I'm not going to say there were any differences because there were. And, and trans people were not treated well by the more bougie uh, gay men who kind of took the movement, which was started by drag and trans. And who and the trans wanted to uh, to help uh, gays, lesbians, trans in prisons, and that was not an appealing uh, uh, goal for the more bougie. You know, we want to get married. You know, we. I mean, if you're living on the streets, marriage is not your concern. We're a tiny community. You know, we're 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 ten percent. You know. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that don't, there's way more than 10% that don't like us. I wish we could stick together. Yeah. And that's, that's what we need. I think it, especially now, like, I think that as we progress and like you see so much hate, especially because of social media and everything, everybody's hating on each other when all we need to do is just be more of a community. Well, social media, um, thrives on, uh, outrage you know, I mean, it's like a drug, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of it at times. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a drug. But being from the South, as you will possibly recall, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. So you end up like moving to New York in 1984. And did you do that with RuPaul or was that separate? Um, we all came up. Rue had a show at the Pyramid, and I was one of the special guests. And um, Rue did not really have that much of an act, so he would bring others to kind of spruce up his non-existent act. <laughs> <laughs> if you want the tea. And so they left. My sister lived here at the time, so I stayed. And uh, boy, were they jealous. They were so jealous that I stayed in New York. And then when they came back, like a year later, um, they were doing a big show at the Limelight. And the Village Voice put in a full color, full page insert that was a gorgeous picture of me that said, uh, darling, Lady Bunny, I'm Lady Bunny, downtown, darling of downtown socialites, inviting you to come and see, you know, the now explosion in RuPaul. And girl, they were so bitter over that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I stayed. I mean, I, 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 as soon as I got here, I told my, you know, roommates back home, sell my few possessions to pay my rent. I'm not to Atlanta. I want, I want you to paint me a picture. So like, let's say it's 1985, it's a Saturday night, you're taking me out. What's the vibe like and where are we going? Well, Pyramid, because that's where I got free drinks and go-go and -go danced on the weekends. And uh, we might also go to Boy Bar, which was a drag bar where they had more polished um, 
you know, drag performers. They were great. And there was, you know, like a, a you know, there were a few blocks away from each other. So there was a, a cross pollination. On a big night, we would go to Area, which was like this socialites club where they had, you know, elaborate installations um, where Lady Keir, uh, before she was in Delight, was often featured in them. Um, and, uh, you know, actually all kinds of artists were there. It was a celebrity hot spot. So when we really felt like we had, you know, like a snazzy outfit or something, and, 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 and it probably wasn't that snazzy, but we thought it was, um, you know, we, we, would, we would go to area. There was also Danceteria, which was a, 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 a big multi-level club. So when we wanted to go out, uh, we would do that too. And uh, we would also hang out on the piers, which at that point were where the uh, voguing ball children would hang out with boom boxes in the back of cars, you know, voguing and, um, you know, all, engaging in all of their madness from, you know, uh, socializing to voguing to drug dealing to prostitution to selling of uh, counterfeit uh, <laughs> or stolen <laughs> designer goods so i mean it was you know or of course looking for you know sex down there because that was where we where that, that was you know where where you kind of the piers were where you cruised for sex and for a while they um had parking there and so people from jersey could come and park at the pier and you would basically do it in the cars i mean new york city was a wild place it's much more sterile and corporate now I'm glad that I saw it when it was absolutely just nuts. Well, I when I was doing some research on you, I went on to YouTube and you have so many videos of you from the 80s because of a videographer named Nelson Sullivan. Yes, who and, was my roommate. Yeah, and I, I was like watching all these things and I was like, oh my gosh, literally Lady Bunny in the 80s. Her whole life is like everywhere. And I was researching and... Did he have like a three-story house that you guys were all in? Yes, in the meatpacking district. Um, and uh, the funny thing about Nelson, a sweet man, but uh, Nelson never really, like he shot everything, but he never edited it. Are you ready yet? Everyone is ready to go. Yes, I am. How do I look? Your nails aren't dry. Well, that's because I'm wearing wet look. So it was always very painful to watch. And, um, you know, I don't like to appear out of drag. And Nelson respected that. And, um, you know, I, 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 I always said, honey, if I'm on stage, you tape anything that I'm doing. You know, if I'm on stage, because that's why I do this, you know, to, because I'm a performer. I said, but just like hanging out in the dressing room and, you know, and, and capturing what I'm doing. I really, I really did not ever like that. So it was kind of like a precursor to, uh, uh, you know, the real world, the real world house or whatever that, and I, I, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I really hated it. And I guess it's because I, when I'm on stage, I know what I'm doing and I've decided that it's entertaining or I've done it before and people liked it. But when I'm just hanging out, you know, I just, I, 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 I think it's kind of vain to, 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 to think that that's going to be entertaining. And I realize now that it's a snapshot, but, um, you know, uh, of, 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 of many years and many pounds ago. <laughs> but um, but one, my favorite video is when he, you know, I was not in drag and Nelson had a dog named Blackout, who was the closest thing to a boyfriend that I've ever had because I loved loved love that dog and i have this uh gift and uh with children and pets to where i will psych them up and then leave them to their parents or owners <laughs> and so with with blackout there is a video of me it, it, nelson didn't want to film me because i wasn't in drag i was i i would the, we had a big living room I, I would wiggle my finger and from across the room, I could make Blackout, the dog, 
bite his owner. <laughs> it was, and I mean, people assume that it was witchcraft, but it was, you know, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing it, but I just love that dog so much. That was, that, that's my favorite video where I'm tormenting a uh, blackout. <laughs> And some of that footage I saw was in your recent documentary, Wig, which was on HBO. And uh -huh. that was all about wig stock. And you end up forming this whole thing back in the 80s. What inspired you to do that? And what was that like seeing it go on for such a long period of time? Well, we had a great run of like, you know, 20 years but then, it, you know, it rained. And that's the, the horrible thing about outdoor events. It rained a couple years in a row and we lost, you know, uh, our shirts. And so, you know, we did it one more time and we broke even. And at that point I was in my forties and I just said, mama, how do you work for three years to break even? And so I was like, that's not, that's not, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a very good plan is it <laughs> and so um so we, we we took a break and we took a break for i think like 15 20 years we did do a couple of events like a, a couple of big stock cruises but then um uh neil patrick harris and his boyfriend david burtka approached us about you know rebooting it for the uh hbo uh, documentary wig that was out last summer. So um, I would love to uh, possibly do it again, uh, but New York City has changed, and we can't. Uh, we we can't. It, 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 you know, you know, there's, there's, we can't just get the park and do this, you know, big event. Uh, it's, it, they've, they've clamped down on stuff like that. I mean, it was so easy in the eighties. And what do you think was the best memory that you have of Wigstock? Well, um, because I was a DJ and, uh, in the nineties house music was the bomb. Um, we, and, and, and because the festival had grown, uh, you know, to where it was attracting 30,000 people, we got some wonderful dance acts, uh, Barbara Tucker, Crystal Waters, Christine W. But when C.C. Peniston sang finally at the height of that record's popularity, I thought that that pier was going to break off into the water because that bass slide is boom. Boom, 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 and it was just like it. I mean, I, it it was. That's an anthem, and just I mean, I she she killed, you know. That would have been crazy to see, and I I have a question because the you know during the eighties and you know the early nineties the AIDS epidemic ended up hitting, and. I can't imagine what that was like. I wasn't there. I'm too young for that. But for the younger generation that may not know, Thank you. <laughs> what what was that like for you? And what was that like for the community, especially in New York? I mean, your friends are dropping like flies. You know, they're dropping quickly. Uh, something as beautiful as you know, sexual expression. Uh, is blighted by a fatal disease. Um, I mean, it was, uh, it was, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think everyone has even uh, fully processed, you know, the, the, the tragedy. And, you know, I know, I know that I uh, was unable uh, to visit a dear friend as he, you know, passed away from AIDS. I mean, I, I visited him, but not as much as I should have because I couldn't deal with my own fear, you know, that, that I might uh, have it. And, you know, I'm such a hypochondriac that I never even got tested until I was 40. And at that time that I'd made up my mind that I was going to, uh, you know, that I, that I was going to be tested, uh, Sarah Palin was uh, running as VP and as a religious nut, who imported a literal 
witch doctor from Africa to pray her into being the mayor of Wasilla, Alaska, I did not want the government knowing, you know, my uh, health information. So, um, you know, it was... It it, it 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 was devastating. I mean, I I don't, you know, I I a, a lot of people who are my age, you know, want to uh, scold younger people because it's not a fatal illness for them because of advances in medication like uh, prep. Um, you know, uh, so I mean, that's a whole different you know, can of worms. I mean, PrEP may prevent HIV, but it sure doesn't prevent herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia, let me say so. I mean, I, you know, personally, a condom, I, I you know, I, I, I was very promiscuous and a condom worked great for me. So, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure why we need, a, you know, drug that costs thousands when a condom costs a dollar, but that's each, each everyone's, you know, personal decision. And one thing that I've wondered is when the AIDS epidemic happened, from history and looking at things, it looked like the LGBT community, LGBT key, ugh, LGBT community was kind of on a trajectory of more people accepting and stuff. Do you believe that if the AIDS epidemic hadn't had happened, we would be more progressive and people would accept the LGBT community more now? Well, the awful event brought us together. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're at each other's throats with the pronouns, with this, with that. And, you know, you know, we had a common tragedy that, you know, bound us. I mean, I don't think that the lesbians were as susceptible to catching HIV, but they were right there with us. And, you know, um, uh, you know, I, 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 hate to, to say that, you know, do, do we need another tragedy to bring us together, but we are not together. And, you know, I, 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 I don't really see much of a gay movement. I mean, if, if, if you, if you, well, first of all, HRC is the primary, uh, you know, organization, and they've endorsed Republicans. They're a business organization, and, you know, they endorsed Hillary Clinton in 2016 um, before even asking, you know, any questions of Bernie Sanders. They've never done that. The idea of an advocacy group is that you you see what, cons what, what platform that benefits, you know, get the LGBT community before you give them an endorsement. They didn't do that in 2016. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that gays have gotten really, really comfortable. They, um, they uh, you know, are, are rightly scared by a Republican regime, you know, and Trump, but they fell asleep during Obama's years and they listen if you don't make any demands you don't get anything and you know to hear obama uh say oh well you know i've evolved on gay marriage uh i believe he said that his kids play with um uh, a gay couple who lives near them and so he evolved on gay marriage and i'm like uh Actually, you're meant to be a leader with a brain, and it doesn't make any difference who moves in next to you. That's like happenstance. And did an Israeli couple move in with you? Because you gave $30 billion, the biggest payment ever to Israel, when Obama was supposed to be the chillier one to Israel than the Republicans. So, you know, it's like I, I found that to be a really – plus um, – Every president breaks bread with a religious group called the family. It's a right-wing think tank. And do you remember the kill, the, the, the gays bill from Uganda? Mm -hmm. they, they created that. They created that. And every president goes and breaks bread with them. If you're an ally of my community, 
you don't break bread with them. Now, Obama did chastise them um, at, when he went to speak at their annual prayer breakfast. But if you're creating, I'm sorry, I see that as a, a as a, uh, a a Broadway out of town tryout. When you're when you are uh, you know when a religious group in the U.S. is is creating kill the gays, you know, Bill in uh, you know Uganda, that's my enemy. That's my brother and sister in, in Uganda's enemy. And I don't want any politician that acts like they're on my side to set foot in their meeting. They should be denouncing them. Listen, gay marriage, we got gay marriage. Now that we got that you know, goal of marriage, we've got to work on the fact that you know, half of the states in the country, I think it is, you can be fired for being gay. You can be denied housing from being for, for being gay. And I'm sorry, I just don't see that uh, as a demand. I don't see that. Um, I don't see people demanding that. I see people who think the gays who think that they're politically, uh, you know, involved. You know, running around saying hashtag hashtag love is love. Well. I'm sorry, that's not a legislative agenda. She's like, are, are we too comfortable? Are, are, yeah. the, are, are the ones leading these groups not worried about getting kicked out of their homes because they have money and they're not gonna be kicked out of their homes or they have a good job, basically. But if we're really gonna care about the less fortunate ones, which is what the drag and the trans that started, you know, Stonewall were, were, were saying, you know? So it's like, are we gonna be a bougie movement or are we going to be a, a movement for all gays because you know um I, I think we i think we need to to be both that's a good point so your friend rupaul in 2009 comes out with some show it's called rupaul's drag race so a lot of people want to know were you ever asked to be a judge on that show ever uh, no, but I was a judge on Drag U. Yes. Would you ever become a judge if Rue asked you? I might. I might. I mean, I, I, I like to do what I do. I like to do my own performance. And so I'm not so concerned about judging other people. And the funny thing is, um, you know, the younger queens uh, sometimes spend hours on their makeup with like, you know, expensive specialty products and lace fronts. They're far more polished than I was. So when I did do the judging thing on Drag U, I said, you know, I'm going to have to have a hair and makeup person because they're going to be reading me because I don't look as good as the, 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 the I mean, my, I'm, I'm not known for, you know, precision makeup. And now that my eyesight's going, Woo! Get ready for Alice Cooper. <laughs> I'm so glad that you laughed because no one knows who that is now. But you know, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I. One thing that bugs me about the drag explosion is that we spend so much time talking about drag, old drag versus new drag. You know what we think of this kind of drag. You know, da 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 da. Judging drag. You know, da. -da that we're no longer doing drag and drag race is uh, it, it, it devalues the only reason that I'm interested in drag performance. So you actually have uh, two Queens perform the same song, um, which is never done in any drag situation. I mean, it doesn't make sense because if you are, you know, uh, a black queen, you're probably not going to nail a country western song in the same way that a Broadway queen is not going to nail a hip hop jam. So you know it that that doesn't make sense to me, and it doesn't really in, enable you know both queens uh, to shine. And um, I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm I, I'm you know I I just turned down this you know, like this uh, symposium on, you know, drag of different ages, because I, you know, I said, if you would like to book me to do what I do, 
then I'd be glad, glad to do that. But right now we're talking more about drag than we're doing drag. And you only perform on Drag Race if you've lost challenges. So it's kind of like the performance is totally de-emphasized and that's what drew me to drag. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like after the, ca the catapult of Drag Race and Queens becoming successful so fast and in a public eye, has that hurt queens that are like seasoned and known like a you or Coco Peru, Jackie Beat stuff. Does that hurt you guys when it comes to gigs and stuff? It's, I mean, I, I've been helped because I have an association with Rue and because I was on drag you and on that roast for the all stars for, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, and they, they, they make jokes about me on the show. I'm known as Rue's crazy, you know, sister so you know it hasn't it hasn't hurt me but look at it this way before drag race there were what 10 15 20 30 nationally known queens who traveled the country or the world and did their act now why did they travel the world and do their act because their act was good. Now we've got people who are booked because they're on a TV show and their act is not necessarily good. Sometimes it's great. So, but yet they're booked everywhere because people have seen them on TV. And, you know, sometimes it becomes more, uh, the, the, the customers are more concerned about the meet and greet than they are the actual performance. So that's not a good development for drag if you're not concerned as much about the, the performance. So, you know, be, before, uh, and I don't know why Rue would book uh, queens so often who aren't great performers. Why not book the great ones? There's, there's young great ones, there's old great ones. You know, why, 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 would you, why would you book someone who can barely walk to a beat? <laughs> That's true. And you, you've been outspoken about Drag Race. I love it when you add your comedy flair and everything on Twitter. Has there ever been a moment where RuPaul's called you and been like, Bunny, that was out of line? No. <laughs> L listen, listen. <laughs> Rue, Rue's image is Mama Rue, the, the self-help guru. But trust me, honey, we have decades of history and Rue is a twisted piece who loves to laugh at everything that I laugh. Now, we, you've, you've been talking this whole interview a lot about, you know, political beliefs and activism and stuff. And I know that on Twitter, you know, you haven't been so fond of, you know, the political candidates that we currently have right now. What do you, what are you looking to do this year for election season? Like wh what is, what's the mindset of Bunny? Well, um, look, and this is what we've got to do. We are making no demands of our government. And I, do, I know that Trump is scary, but we have got to remember the Boston Tea Party, where they threw that tea in the harbor saying no taxation without representation. So that means you take our, our, our tax dollars, you do what we want with it. You don't give it, you don't give bailouts to huge corporations that, should, that have been making billions and should have some money for the bank while we sit and wait on a $1,200 check you know, by the time it gets here, that is going to be spent. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that people have just, you know, put their heads in the sand. And, you know, um, I, 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 I am not confident that Joe Biden is going to beat Trump. And that makes me very sad. And I wish that we had, you know, um, I wish that we, I, I wish that they could swoop in and replace, you know, Joe Biden. Um, you know, he, 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 
he he is a worse nominee than Hillary Clinton and is is low enthusiasm and at least she had like the you know I'm a woman voter I, you know we deserve you know he doesn't even have that so you know I'm 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 very concerned and one thing that's going on currently right now is you know we have coronavirus but you have taken their time in quarantine and you have a comedy special called Contagious. Now, what is all of that about? And tell people why they need to watch this. To make them laugh in a crazy, crazy time. Um, you know, my humor is raunchy and irreverent and there's uh, loads of new song parodies from artists uh, as varied as Lizzo, Justin Bieber, um, uh, God, Madonna, uh, I can't even remember the rest. But, um, you know, I also do a few skits. And um, Christine, do you know this drag performer? Yeah. Christine with two E's, total nut job, who is a spirit animal. We're doing a duet. Um, and that does get a teeny bit political, but for the most part, it's just 35 minutes of fun. But, you know, I because I was you know, at home most of the time, I started writing and I, you know, I said, let me just give this a shot. And, you know, so I was having wigs and outfits, uh, you know, mail ordered. And, you know, for, for those weeks when I was shooting it, it made me feel like, um, you know, I'm back at work again and I'm not despondent and, and I've got, you know, a project. And, you know, if I had done the, the live streams with this same company, Boss Events, um, you know, uh, it, it just, I, 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 I'm a worker bee and I needed to do uh, something. And this made me feel like I was back in the game because even after, you know, the restrictions about who can go where are relaxed, people are not going to want to sit in close audiences or be on dance floors. And the other issue is that a lot of people are going to have money mm -hmm. to go and do the stuff that they used to do. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to have an online following. And it was fun because, you know, honey, I'm a technic. You saw how long it took me to get to the Zoom to work, you know, um, you know, and I, and I had to order all of these lights and, you know, all this kind of stuff, uh, you know, backdrops and stuff like that. So it was, it was, you know, a fun experiment and hopefully it will, you know, turn into a lucrative experiment and I'll do more because it's kind of like having a comedy special you know, without, I mean, I mean, you know, bypassing the gatekeepers of TV and some of this is dirty. <laughs> so they ain't gonna put it on TV anyway. <laughs> That's so great. And um, guys, if you're watching this, the link is gonna be down below to where you can click and you can buy and you can sign and see it all. Um, so Bunny, as we're bringing all this to a close, what do you think the biggest misconception of Lady Bunny is? Um. Probably that I'm a bitch because um, I am forthright. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not the type of person to attack people, but since my, you know, act can be part daffy, part, you know, bitchy, then if you just know me from the stage, you know, you might think, ooh, she's, she's, she's rough. But, you know, I'm actually not. I, actually, whenever I travel to places where I haven't be, you know, been, they're like one suitcase, no assistance. You don't want any drugs or drinks. You're like the low maintenance diva. <laughs> and I like, I like being the low maintenance diva because, honey, you know what? With some of the stuff these people are asking for, darling, you're gonna get that one. And then they're not going to have anything to do with you. So you, 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 you. I, I think it's important to, um, to, you know, to to be easy to work with. And I'm sure there will be someone coming out of the the woodwork saying, "Well, you sure were a bitch in Phoenix," you know. But 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 that's a you know that's a thirty year plus career. <laughs> there will be a few slip ups. And what is a message that you have for especially the younger lgbtq community 
um, that you believe that they should know or they should appreciate about the older community? Get your ass out in the streets and make some demands, you know? I don't see that. I see, I see, you know, some of it, but, you know, I, 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 I get your ass in the streets and make some fucking demands. Organize. You know, what, what, I mean, if you were to ask the average person uh, who was young or gay, what is the gay agenda? What are we fighting for? In addition to a parade, what, what, what is, you know, obviously AIDS was so frightening that we were bound together for our own survival. But, you know, what is it now? It's like, so we, we've got to be a little smarter. Mm-hmm. We've got to do a little bit of digging. Yeah, and get out there, like you said, and actually try to, like, you know, support the cause and push things forward and speak up. Because if you don't speak up, nothing's going to happen and nothing's going to change. And it can go right back to years and years ago, go right back in reverse. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here, Lady Bunny, and talking to us and exposing your life. Um, And (laughs) guys, be sure to check out Lady Bunny's special, her comedy special, Contagious. The actual link will be down in the description, so you can click that and go straight to it. It's available June 5th. And Lady Bunny, are you on the socials? Where can people find you on these socials? Yes, Instagram is official underscore lady underscore bunny. Twitter is at lady bunny 77 and Facebook's just lady bunny. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode of Exposed with Lady Bunny. If you liked it, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel. Comment what you love below. What was your favorite part about Lady Bunny? Let me know who you want me to interview next on Exposed. And please be sure to click that little Patreon link in the description box and subscribe to my Patreon so you can help me keep putting these videos out. Thank you to all those that do subscribe and thank you for supporting my vision. I love you guys until next time. Bye. Thank you.